Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial, money invested in more. Quick market note. The S&P 500 and the NASDAQ rose for a sixth straight day, setting another record. 36 record high of the year for the S&P 500. It's been a pretty astonishing run, especially when you add in the last two months of last year. So a lot of wealth is being created. Jay Powell told the Senate he likes what he's seeing on the inflation front and that a cut could be coming because he doesn't see an overheating economy anymore. Let's talk with CFP Chad Burton. When I'm talking with Chad, that means we're promoting a new event. Um, And it is, in this case, a new event. It's something that interests me enormously. The concept of a tax-conscious portfolio in retirement. It's creating wealth. I'm not going to say it was easy. Managing wealth is a lot trickier in my mind than creating wealth. And um, managing it once you hit 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, and you want to not avoid taxes, but you want to be tax conscious so that you're not kicking into other tax brackets. You're not making mistakes per se, because you don't have time to make, you don't have time to fix them. Mistakes in retirement are costly because the time element, not necessarily because the money element, but anyway, big event coming up Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830 Crown Plaza, Foster City in San Mateo with CFP, Chad Burton from EP Wealth Plan, your future strategies for building a tax conscious retirement portfolio. Chad, um, let's start with a quick premise here of people coming into a windfall you know you could either create the wealth or you can have a windfall in this case let's talk about a windfall an inheritance of cash um what would you start doing on a tax efficient portfolio from scratch from scratch well let's say we're you know kind of in a situation where you're moving into retirement so let's say you're in your 60s uh maybe that's from a lot of options that have vested and you've got cash from that or inheritance of cash or whatever. So you've been building your portfolio over time and you've got cash and you've got your 401k, maybe a Roth IRA, maybe an IRA. And you realize you're going into retirement. So you need to, what's called a balanced portfolio. Okay. And, and all that means is you've got a mix of different asset classes, whether it's stocks, bonds, cash, and alternatives such as real estate, private equity, private credit, those, those types of things that that go into a higher net worth portfolio. Okay. When you have a lot of cash in your taxable account that you can work around, you can then create a tax efficient portfolio, meaning holding the right asset classes in the right type of accounts in order to keep your taxes lower. So first of all, when, when we talk about investing, Rob, there is, you know, kind of two camps, right? You've got people that have most of their assets that they have for retirement and their 401k. And no matter what you do, everything you take out of your 401k is 100% taxable when you retire. Right? Okay. So it does, we're, not, we're not talking about that situation because in that situation, it's just asset allocation. We're talking about a person that has different types of accounts. They have taxable accounts, retirement accounts, Roth accounts. Sure. And so when you're building this portfolio, you have to realize that there's different tax events that can happen when it comes to investing in stocks and bonds and other asset classes like that, you know, stocks pay dividends, right? And in the world of asset allocation, we know that you have, you know, large cap, small cap, mid cap, and international and emerging markets. Now, if a stock in the U S pays a dividend like Apple, Microsoft, Cisco, that dividend is taxed at the capital gains bracket, which for most people, especially, you know, working in California, is a much lower tax bracket than ordinary income. So that right there tells you that typically in your taxable account, you want to hold U.S.-based stocks, and you still want to have international exposure to international and and emerging markets, but those funds, because those stocks that pay dividends, those dividends are taxed at ordinary income, so you might want to hold those in your retirement accounts. So that as those stocks pay dividends, you don't pay taxes on them at all until you take them out and live off of them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing that can happen is bonds pay interest, right? And so you have a couple of different types of bonds. You have tax-free bonds, tax-free municipal bonds. So if you have a California tax-free municipal bond, you know, let's say it earns three and a half, four percent 4% in interest payments, that's tax-free at the state and federal level. 
Okay. So those are fine in a taxable account. But then when you have a corporate bond, as those as that pays interest out, you're going to pay 100% ordinary income, state and federal on that in California. So you want to, again, hold those corporate bonds in your taxable account. So you want both types of bonds in a balanced portfolio, and you just have to hold them in the right place. The other thing that can happen, and most people invest in mutual funds, right, Rob, or, or ETFs these days versus individual stocks. So inside of a mutual fund or an ETF, there's changes that are made. That's called turnover. Okay. So um, in a large cap or an S&P 500 style fund where you invest in S&P 500, there's really only typically like one event per year where stocks are kicked out of the S&P 500 and new stocks are added in, or there's a rebalance like recently with NVIDIA and Apple. So you could hold that fund and you can buy it. And when there's a major change, you can end up paying capital gains taxes when there is turnover. Now, when you look at successful small cap and mid cap funds, they have more turnover than say a large cap fund, right? Because typically large cap funds, you're holding them for longer and you're not paying capital gains, whereas successful small and mid cap funds um, have more turnover, meaning the manager has to, if they buy a stock this year, they might sell um, a couple of different stocks throughout the year causing capital gains. So you want to minimize those capital gains. So typically in your taxable account, you want large cap, a little bit of maybe mid cap, um, and tax-free bonds, but the other asset classes that you might hold, like international, emerging markets, corporate bonds, uh, private credit, that those asset classes should be held in your retirement accounts. Uh, so, so as a household, you have a bunch of different accounts, and you want your pie chart to be the right way in terms of what your allocation should be, large cap, small cap, mid cap, international, emerging markets, private credit, real estate, all those different items, but you want to hold them in the right accounts to minimize taxes. And that's the idea with building a tax efficient retirement portfolio is that you are is in control of taxes as much as possible. You're not just paying random taxes that on money that you're not even using yet. A lot going on there. Um, we have a big event coming up. Not that far off next week, July 18th, Thursday, 630 to 830. <clears throat> Looking forward to learning more about setting up a tax conscious retirement portfolio with CFP Chad Burton. It's in the Crown Plaza, Foster City, San Mateo, Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830. I'll be there a couple hours early. We'll bring some CFPs and we'll answer all your questions. <clears throat> but this event also covers some things like social security. I did just get my social security statement last night in the middle of the night, Chad, and I, I look forward to looking at it to see how wealthy I'm going to be from social security. 30. So how wealthy, huh? Will, <laughs> um, see, well, okay. so we'll see what it looks like when uh, you and I actually finally retire, right? Yeah, you and I are going to be neighbors. We're going to compare our social security checks. Um, it's CFP Chad Burton. You can learn more about him at chadburton.com. It's chadburton.com. Yeah. I love the idea of living next to him. I can steal a lot of his ideas. A little just spill out of his brain. Crown Plaza Foster City, Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830. A new event, Tax Conscious Retirement Portfolios. Sign up at chadburton.com or robblackshow.com. Maybe you feel like you're in good shape for retirement, but have you really taken everything into account? Find out how you're doing at a new new seminar called Strategies for Building a Tax-Conscious Retirement Portfolio, July 18th at the Crown Plaza in Foster City, hosted by Rob Black and CFP Chad Burton of EP Wealth Advisors. Rob will provide timely commentary and Chad will share specific strategies for taxes, income, long-term care, safe money, retirement products, alternative investments, estate protection goals, and more. If you have at least $500,000 in investable assets and want to retire better, pass on your estate and minimize taxes, this event is for you. Find out if you're on the right track at this free Strategies for Building a Tax-Conscious Retirement event. That's Thursday evening, July 18th, 6.30 to 8.30 at the Crown Plaza in Foster City. Space is limited, so sign up today at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Quick side notes. Disney's adding a new ship in Tokyo to its expanding cruise businesses. Um, the ninth vessel for the brand's growing fleet, 4,000 passenger capacity. It will bring in $621 million in annual sales. That's a lot of do-re-me for a boat. 
And uh, I just like looking at the business model of Disney. Um, CFP Chad Burton is here today promoting a seminar that is coming up. It is a new one. It is one that is most fascinating to me um, as I'm starting to move from my portfolio that is not tax conscious. It is heavily tied towards capital gains to a portfolio that needs to be a lot more tax conscious in the retirement year. So I don't feel like most of my wealth is going away in capital gains. Plan your future strategies for building a tax conscious retirement portfolio um, with CFP Chad Burton at the Crown Plaza, Foster City. Great parking, easy parking. Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830. That's Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830. Um, I'll be there a couple hours early and I'll bring a, a slew of CFPs, probably three plus CFPs with Chad of there as well. So that's four plus a lot of great brains to pick. If you want financial planning questions answered, that's Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830. Chad, um, was I kind of getting it right that I've built, and you know what I have, I've built a very, um, not very tax conscious portfolio. I've got a lot of capital gains. Most of my wealth is in regular accounts and it's not necessarily in 401ks. Have I, have I created a problem for myself? Well, no, cause I mean, you know, capital gains exposure means your stocks went way up in value, right? That's so right. that's okay. What I'm talking about is when you're, you're creating a portfolio is paying unnecessary taxes, right? If you're holding the wrong assets in the wrong accounts and the wrong types of accounts, then you're paying uh, taxes on dividends and interest and capital gains that you're not yet using to live. You're still living off of your paycheck. So you want to minimize your taxes as much as possible. Now, with that said, Rob, when you're over concentrated in a single stock and you're taking too much risk, especially if you're close to retirement, sometimes it is better to go ahead and sell, pay taxes and diversify Okay. or use other strategies like a charitable remainder trust or some other strategy to at least minimize taxes and do it in, in the right way, but never let taxes be your primary decision maker if you are in a situation where you have too much risk in your portfolio as you're near retirement. So sometimes paying taxes is good, but what I'm talking about is you know building portfolios where you're 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 not paying unnecessary taxes. So let's talk about this. Um I know that you're a certified financial planner practitioner. I know that you uh, work with a lot of wealthy people. Uh, do wealthy people approach tax efficient investing differently than the average investor where putting cash to work is, is the idea? Yeah. I mean, there's some options available for higher net worth individuals because a lot of different options might have a $250,000 account minimum for an asset class. So to go back before I, I get into this idea of, for example, direct indexing, um, let's talk about the S&P 500 for a minute, right? Okay. I think you went over this with our, uh, our head portfolio strategist, Adam Phillips recently, where it's just, we are seeing the most concentrated S&P 500 in our entire 30 plus year career, Rob. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? And yeah, yet, I mean, it, it looks poised to get them even more concentrated in the future years. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's so, it's very tech and communication services heavy because of where the revenue is going into AI and cloud right. storage and things like that. Yep. This year though, when we think about the return of the S&P 500 hitting all times highs above 17% um, as of, you know, July 10th year, um, 70% of the return is coming from 10 stocks in the S&P 500. Um, so when you look at this for the year, since January, about 40% of the stocks in the S&P 500 are actually down for the year. If we look at this over the last three months, the S&P 500 over the last three months is up 7%, which is almost a full year's worth of return. But 51 stocks in that index lost more than 20% over that same period of time. It's mind blowing. So you have a couple of choices as an investor when you're, you know, most people these days for their large cap exposure are really kind of just looking at the S&P 500. It's a large okay. cap index, but it's a market cap weighted index where, where the top 10 stocks are, are um, you know, 36% of the total because it's like Microsoft is a little over 7%, Apple's a little over 7%, NVIDIA is 6.72. So it's a market cap weighted index. Now, and the S&P 500 for most large cap managers is tough to beat over time. It's been a great index to be invested in. Um, so indexing for large cap works really well. I prefer active management or a mix of active and passive and small cap, mid cap and international because I think that the numbers show that active 
over time can get the same results with less volatility, less risk. Um, but in large cap, I'm kind of, I don't really care if it's active or, or passive or a bit of both. Passive is just fine, but there's different ways to approach it. So as an investor and you're investing in a taxable account, let's say you inherited some cash or sold a bunch of other stock and you need to put it to work and you want to buy large cap or S&P 500 in your taxable account, you can go buy a mutual fund from Vanguard, for example, that is the S&P 500. But even more tax efficient is an ETF, an exchange traded fund. The way that they're structured exposes people less to, to previous capital gains that have occurred in that fund. So there's so many different ways to invest in the SP 500. There's SPY, IVV, VOO, and, and several different options where you own, with one investment, you own exposure to the S&P 500. Now, if you're wealthy and you have a larger account, you can do what's called direct indexing, where you can go create that S&P 500 index, but actually own all 500 individual stocks at the same weighting. But you can do a tax overlay on it so that you're doing tax loss harvesting. So like this year, for example, 40% of the stocks are down in the S&P 500. So you could do tax loss harvesting where you sell that stock at a loss day out of it for 30 uh, days, at least 30 days. In, in, in that period of time, you're investing in something similar, but you're, so you're still fully invested, but you harvest that loss. If you're an individual investor, wealthier person, and you're going to have capital gains this year and the future from selling your business, other stock, real estate, by harvesting those losses, you can kind of create this bank account that can offset future capital gains. So you can get the same investment results, but better tax situation with direct indexing. A lot going on there. I look forward to the new presentation from CFP Chad Burton with EP Wealth. It's going to be Thursday, July 18th, 6.30 to 8.30. It's going to be strategies for building a tax-conscious retirement portfolio. You can sign up at Rob Black Show or chadburton.com in Foster City, San Mateo, Crown Plaza, July 18th. Don't want to work forever? Check out the Retirement Planning Guide on robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial, money, investing, and more. Usually I do a show where I talk about some of the day's headlines. Not today. I get the luck and privilege of speaking with CFP Chad Burton, who I've met 25 years ago, roughly. And um, I've always liked his insights into what retirement's going to look like and how we should set it up. I think he's one of the best at explaining things. So when he says he's going to do a new slideshow and a new presentation for a seminar, I get excited. Strategies for building a tax-conscious retirement portfolio, which is something that's on my brain. Um, you've heard me say many times, like, there's income stocks. Coca-Cola is a famous one. I'm not saying go buy Coca-Cola. I'm saying it's a famous one. Warren Buffett owns a dividend-paying stock, and he makes good money on his dividends. In retirement, he hasn't per se gone to work nine to five like most of us. He is an investor, but um, he's he could live off his dividends. He could live off his dividends. And that's kind of where you want to get to, but I don't think it's that simple. Strategies for Building a Tax-Conscious Retirement Portfolio, CFP Chad Burton, Thursday, July 18, 630 to 830. It's in Foster City at the Crown Plaza. Chad, um, talk about Warren Buffett and, and living off dividends. That seems like the life, right? Um where you get a little bit of the equity growing for you, like a Coca-Cola over time, but you get the dividend paycheck that comes every three months. Um, looking at your clientele or looking at the industry, how many people make it to you know, just living off dividends and not having to sell assets and downsize their homes and do some uh, things that could have tax consequences? Uh, well, I'd say that's not, that's definitely not most of America. I'd say that's a, a good portion of the clients that I individually work with, but even as EP as a whole with, you know, um, the 20, over 25 billion of assets that we manage, I think that that's probably not even the norm there where most clients, most people can't just live off the dividends, right? Because if you look at a typical stock portfolio, um, that's diversified between large cap, small cap, mid cap, and international. The stock side, the dividends are probably going to be around 2% of a portfolio. And then the, the bonds are going to be somewhere between three and a half to 5% of the portfolio. Then you got real estate and private, uh, private credit. Um, so, you know, 
most people at retirement at 65 draw four to 5% of their portfolio to pay their expenses and a good balanced portfolio. Um, even though the total return, which is growth plus current income is, is much higher. The current income, regardless of market conditions tends to be, you know, in the three to three and a half percent range. So if you're wealthy enough to where that is more than what you need to pay all your expenses and healthcare costs and taxes, and you're in a great spot and a lot of really good companies tend to raise their dividend every year, even in down markets. So it's that dividend growth that you and I have talked about for years where buying good, especially large mid cap companies that have history raising their dividend, that's, that's a bit of an inflation fighter too, right? Because if you're, you start off with your portfolio at 65 and you're able to live off of the income, well, it, as inflation grows, your income needs are going to grow. So if your dividends and interest aren't growing, then you know, you're going to have to start pulling out principal, which is most of America, Rob. I mean, it's, that's, that's okay in retirement is that you're going to be pulling a little bit of mostly in the beginning, it's mostly uh, dividend and interest income. But as you age and you need to spend more because of inflation, you're going to start pulling some, some principal out as well over time. It's interesting. Um, there's a story out there today about Costco raising the starting wages by an hour to $19 and 50 cents an hour. Um, one of the people that came to my pints and portfolio is a guy who owns about $3 million of Costco. And you know how he got it, Chad? working for the company and just yep. buying into the, the options. And um, I think that's fascinating, but he, he has that situation where he's going to start downsizing at some point, but it also has a nice dividend. So he got, he got very lucky for an American to uh, figure out working there as well as investing there. So pretty interesting stuff. Let's talk about real estate in retirement because a lot of the Bay area has real estate and it's done very well historically, maybe not in the last two years. Maybe not in 2008, but in the last 30 years, it's created a lot of wealth for Californians. What should we be thinking about tax-wise when it comes to real estate and retirement? Well, tax-wise, when it comes to real estate, so there, there's two pieces of real estate, right? You can okay. buy a real estate investment trust at a portfolio. Okay. Uh, most of those are totally liquid on you know the New York Stock Exchange, right? There's REITs. There's, there's also some really good private REITs that I really like right now because of what's happening in the real estate market and some of the deals that are that some of these good funds are going to be able to take advantage of because we all know the turmoil in commercial real estate right rob i mean we're going to be dealing with really rough news on commercial real estate and the refinance issues and the low cap rates probably for the next two to three years and you're going to see valuations go up and down and move all over the place. But um, some of these funds and REITs have really good income. But I think what you're getting at is people that own rental properties, right? Yeah, I was going that direction for sure, but yeah. we can hit it all. Do you, do yeah. you know one third of corporate space in San Francisco is empty? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, That's a big and, number. And the biggest issue is a lot of those buildings um, are leveraged. And the last time that they you know, finance that because in commercial properties, you're typically refinancing every five to 10 years. That's the way the loans work. So by nature, a third of all, um, uh, you know, commercial loans are coming due in the next, what, 12 to 18 months. Um, and those are all going to be refinanced at higher rates at the same time as there's low vacancy. So a lot of those buildings are going to be sold. Um, that's happened in some apartment buildings and things like that. So there are certain real estate investment trusts, especially, um, you know, some of the private ones that are available only to higher net worth individuals are really going to be able to take advantage of that in terms of long-term really good purchases. Uh, but the the news on commercial real estate is still going to be ugly for the next probably two years. Um, so just keep that in mind. But I think what if we go to the idea of, of real estate, the proper way to build wealth in real estate is you're typically doing some leveraging and you're constantly improving and swapping properties, right? So you buy one rental property, uh, maybe you, you improve it, you rent it for several years, um, you get the value out of that when you do a 1031 exchange into another leveraged property and you just continue to build wealth. Okay. As people move into retirement, and, and by the way, when you're doing improvements, um, that adds to basis in, in what's called your depreciation. So when you own a rental property, the, the, the value of the building on the, on the land, not the land, but just the building, you can depreciate over 27 and a half years. And so what that does is if you have positive rental income where, okay, here's my rent minus my expenses, like property taxes, insurance, in some cases, property management, that, that number, that net income is taxable 
but the depreciation offsets the taxation of that to a pretty good extent. What I'm finding, though, a lot of in the Bay Area especially, is people that have owned rental properties for years and years and years, where they don't have any depreciation left. Yep. They're paying taxes on 100% of the net income, and the net income is, is garbage when you divide it by the value of the real estate. So you know, recently there was one that we helped. There's some clients that moved out of Walnut Creek into Idaho years ago, but they still have this Walnut Creek rental property. And the value of the rental property, if they sell it, was just over a million. But the net income, which is their rent minus their expenses, was only $24,000 a year, right? That's 2.4% current income on that. And when you can get 4 to 5% in a money market, that's not a very good return anymore. Um, they were tired of dealing with the renter. They were dealing with homeowner losing homeowners insurance, and homeowners insurance can continue to get more expensive. They're just done, right? They didn't they didn't want to do a ten thirty one exchange anywhere else and and be active anymore. They wanted to go into retirement and keep life simple. Um, so what you have to do is you got to do the math, right? If they bought this property for Two hundred and fifty grand twenty five years ago, and most of that was depreciated. If if they sell it, they're not only going to pay capital gains on the seven hundred thousand dollars of gain that they have, which would be about one hundred and sixty k federal and about ninety k state in taxes. That's a lot of money. But they would also have to recapture all the depreciation they took over all those years at a twenty five percent rate, federal rate. Um, so very rarely does it make sense to sell. A rental property. Typically, you're doing a 1031 exchange into something better so you can avoid paying those capital gains. You know what's funny uh, about that, Chad? What's that? As I'm getting older, I kind of want to sell my rental property just because it's annoying mm-hmm. and I'm not thinking taxes. It's not when I say annoying, it's just kind of like simplifying my life. Yeah. Do, you, do you hear that from people or am I, I just a we're, we're hearing person? it constantly? I mean, okay. On a, uh, this is some of the the most frequent calls that we're getting are also the you know the homeowners insurance it's the it's a nightmare in California right now. Oh, there's a great article in the San Francisco Chronicle about two things that are driving people out of the Bay Area or out of California and insurance as well as uh, homeowners associations. They're just they're going sky high and people can't afford yeah. it. Oh, so. and you got rent control on top of that. You've got the situation now. You know, you used to be able to leave your rental properties to your heirs. And okay. they could keep it as a rental property and maintain the same property tax, but that doesn't happen anymore. So there's a huge reassessment when you pass that rental property onto your kids and the net income looks even worse. So property values have actually held up really well in the Bay Area versus interest rates. Okay. But the rents haven't increased enough. And so if you're done building wealth and you're not ready to do a 1031 exchange where you're leveraging a little bit more into a bigger, better property and trying to improve that, you're not an active real estate investor anymore and you want to go passive then there's other options out there um, that we can go into, which are called DSTs, Delaware Statutory Trust, or 721 exchanges that um, can help you know, get rid of the property, the management problems, in many cases, increase your net income, and in, in, in some cases, increase your uh, liquidity after a certain period of time, which we can talk about, and your tax benefits as well. Sounds go. good. Let me uh, pump the seminar a little bit right now. Strategies for building a tax conscious retirement portfolio. This is number one in my head as far as wealth management at this point in time. Uh, Chad's doing a new event Thursday, July 18, 630 to 830 Crown Plaza, Foster City. Super easy parking, super easy to get to from San Francisco, San Jose and the East Bay, as well as all of the peninsula. You can sign up for the event at chadburton.com or Rob Black Show. Again, it's Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 8:30. Strategies for building a tax conscious retirement portfolio. This interview featured on the Rob Black Show is brought to you by EP Wealth. Learn more at robblack.com. The longer that I live on this planet, the more certain I am that CFP practitioners um, have an interesting job. Um, as I turn closer to those retirement years, um, I have a lot of questions. I enjoyed my life, um, married twice, two kids, created wealth, a good, nice career. But then there, that becomes the big retirement issue in my, in my head. And that's a tough one to put all the answers into place. Um, everything up to this point was pretty easy. So I've got rental properties. I've got a home that's nice. I've got a second home. 
Uh, how do I leave it to my kids tax efficiently? Um, is there a step up in basis? Is there capital gains to be thought of in my portfolio, whether it be my stock portfolio, whether it be my 401k, whether it be um, the homes that I've accumulated, things like that. It's 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 pretty intimidating. Chad does a really nice job of meeting people on their level and talking about their life. If you want to meet with CFP Chad Bertendor's team, Ryan and Julie, um, Dan as well, uh, they're all CFPs and they all bring a great skill set to the table. You can set an appointment with him by heading to chadburton.com. It's chadburton.com. I talk to one of your CFPs on a regular basis, Chad, and um, she's as much of a wealth of knowledge as you are, uh, Julie. And um, she's just a pleasure to speak to. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but uh, a lot of us work with like attorneys and they're not nice to talk to, but CFPs, they seem to be pretty nice and they give me answers, which I always like. Um, big event coming up Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830 at 630 to 830. Uh, Crown Plaza, Foster City, Strategies for Building a Tax-Conscious Retirement Portfolio. Um, I do like that phrase, building a tax-conscious. Um, what do you think tax-conscious means to you, Chad? Like, Or what should it mean to me? It should mean that, uh, you know, at a basic level, there's there's ordinary income tax brackets and there's capital gains brackets. And capital gains brackets kick in when, if you own a stock for a year, or more and sell it or real estate or business and you've owned it for more than a year and you sell it, that's how the gains are taxed. It's also how the dividends from US-based corporations are taxed. Ordinary income is how your paycheck is taxed. It's how interest in your bank account is taxed um, and other areas. And so they're, they're, capital gains is one bracket, ordinary income is a, another. And then investments can either kick off dividends, interest, both, or capital gains. And certain funds have more turnover than others. And so the idea is that, okay, I want to invest in each of these asset classes, but I need to hold them in the right type of account. um, And I need to reduce taxes as much as possible so that I'm not paying too much to uh, on my tax return each year and more stays in my account earning interest for me. What do you think about, you and I know this term, and I think most people do, but dividend achievers. What do you think about um, the ETF dividend achievers versus handpicking dividend achievers. Yeah, I mean, I love it both. I love them both. Okay. So if you there's there's a couple of different versions of dividend achievers, but you and I have talked about this for years. It goes way back to a book that you referenced on radio. I don't know what 15 years ago, Merchants Dividend Achievers. Yeah. Um, a little, so they're a little it, secret been, that I didn't tell everyone. <laughs> yeah, and so. Um, the the idea there is that you're you're typically picking large and a little bit of mid-sized companies that are good companies in terms of how are they valued, right? Price to earnings ratio, cash flow, price to book, price to sales. Um, so when you're when you're doing a screen of let's say the stocks in the S and P five hundred, you're saying okay, I want stocks that meet certain metrics in terms of valuation. Um, so I want them to be fairly priced, but I also want them to have a dividend of at least one percent. And I want them to have a history of raising their dividend by an average of 10% per year. So that's not 10% every year. They might you know, do 20% one year and skip the next. But when you look at a five to 10 year period, they're typically averaging a 10% dividend increase. And so um, that is when you look at periods of time in the last five to 10 years, the S&P 500 with this recent rally has outperformed that strategy. Um, but if you look at a, a 20 year period, they're very close with a bit less volatility and better potential for current income from the dividend achiever index. So it's a, uh, it's a really great approach for retirees that I want to own stocks. I'm able to live off of dif- just my dividends, but I need those dividends to go up to fight inflation. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm a very big fan of that strategy. So I like mixing some S and P 500 indexing, a little bit of active management, a little bit of, uh, you know, when you look at that dividend achiever approach, mm-hmm. it's basically indexing with rules on top of it. Um, cool. So okay. you have indexing, pure indexing, which are matching the S&P 500 exactly, for example. You have smart beta or rules-based indexing, which cuts out a certain group of stocks, like non-profitable stocks or stocks that don't have a dividend or stocks that don't increase their dividend. So it's just kind of narrowing down what you want to own. Now, when you're younger that dividend in achiever approach isn't quite as important as when you're older living off of your dividends. So um, it's, it's a really good way to approach your large cap exposure as you're in retirement. 
you ever see hiccups where the dividends don't quite make, uh, they don't quite achieve what the goal was, like in a five-year period, it does the first two years, it doesn't in the third year, but it does in the final. Are there, is it smooth planning? When you talk about investing right there, you hit something that we talk about at, at most events, which is volatility in a portfolio. Right. Okay. And so there's the one example that I show where you have two investments and one of them has a lower average annual rate of return where you take up each year's total return and divide it by 10. The one that had the lower average annual rate of return actually ends up with more money because it was less volatile and it got to that point um, with less volatility and a lower and lower declines and more steady return. You know, so, I love that slide. Yeah, it's 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 just I mean, math is really what got me into investing yeah. in the world of financial planning when I was 19. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that that geometric mean everybody picks based on the five and 10 year average annual return, which can be very misleading if you don't look at the that how did they get to that average annual return? Was it one or two big years and a bunch of t- mediocre or terrible years? Or was it a very steady rate of return? And so it's important to look at that, especially in retirement, when you're trying to smooth out returns, right? You don't want a ton of volatility because then you lose sleep at night. Sounds good. Thanks, Chad. Uh, We will see you Thursday, July 18th, 630 to 830 at the Crown Plaza Foster City for a new event called Strategies for Building a Tax Conscious Retirement Portfolio. You can sign up at Rob Black Show or chadburton.com. It is a new event and it's maybe our last live event of the year. Um, sign up at robblackshow.com. Maybe you feel like you're in good shape for retirement, but have you really taken everything into account? Find out how you're doing at a new seminar called Strategies for Building a Tax-Conscious Retirement Portfolio, July 18th at the Crown Plaza in Foster City, hosted by Rob Black and CFP Chad Burton of EP Wealth Advisors. Rob will provide timely commentary, and Chad will share specific strategies for taxes, income, long-term care, safe money, retirement products, alternative investments, estate protection goals, and more. If you have at least $500,000 in investable assets and want to retire, Hire better, pass on your estate, and minimize taxes, this event is for you. Find out if you're on the right track at this free Strategies for Building a Tax-Conscious Retirement event. That's Thursday evening, July 18th, 630 to 830 at the Crown Plaza in Foster City. Space is limited, so sign up today at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. 